Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome at CC, hello and welcome at one, two, three, four, five, six. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. There we go, rolling. I always tell people, first off, if you finish a film, a short film, whatever, like you're already succeeding, you know what I mean? Think of all the millions of stories that want to be told that aren't, and at least you have something finished. My heart hurt for the mountains and home, so Jonathan, <laughs> the, the sweetheart that he is, agreed that he would come back with me. And so we brazenly, uh, with our company only one year old, decided that we could make it work. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 40. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Today, we're going to talk a bit about B-roll and shooting basic coverage for your documentary films. Recently, you know, we've covered the importance of score music for your film, and we've talked about how to make your docs a bit more cinematic looking, right? Separate it from the pack. But what we haven't talked specifically about is the importance of creating the best looking B-roll that you can for your film, and how by the very nature of it, surprisingly, it's sometimes often overlooked in its importance. I'm your host, Chris G. Parkhurst. This is The Documentary Life. And when we come back from a quick break, I got you, B-roll, right here. I'm going to ask of you something that I don't think I've asked of you for, for well over a year. I need a favor. I need you to go to iTunes right now and give this show a five-star rating and maybe even write a few words for a review. When I first started doing the podcast, I was asking you this on a regular basis. You might remember it was like the first three or four episodes. It's, it's clearly been a while since then. So I, I'm asking you now because I'd like to see this podcast get out to more people. That can happen if the documentary life comes up in more iTunes searches. In order for this to occur, iTunes basically needs to see more activity in what's known as its ratings and reviews section. The more ratings and reviews a show gets, the more it'll come up in, in searches. So, you know, for when people are searching for documentary film podcasts, we are, we're far more likely to come up in their searches if iTunes is, is seeing more of this activity. You know this show is a passion of mine, so please help me keep growing this documentary community of ours. If the documentary life has benefited you in any way, please take a moment right now, head to iTunes, uh, search for the Documentary Life podcast, look for the ratings and reviews tab, and then leave us a five-star rating and review. I can promise you that every single one of these ratings and reviews gives it a little bump in the iTunes popularity rating, thereby, again, increasing the visibility of the show. If you do have any trouble finding the ratings and reviews area, I've added a direct link to it in the show notes for this episode. In advance, thank you for helping me to continue spreading the documentary life love. Do you need shots of ordinary people doing things for your next commercial? We got that B-roll. We got that B-roll. Two men pointing at an office file? We got that B-roll. Bored man flipping through channels? We got that B-roll. Angry man in traffic? Yeah, we got that B-roll. What do you want him to wear? Casual? Upscale casual? Business? We got that B-roll. Why does he look so upset? Maybe he's late for work. Nope, he's at work. He's a B-roll actor. 
you might recognize that little tidbit from the viral video sensation from a few years back. The video is called We Got That B-Roll, and it was brought to you by the geniuses behind the, the Cream Sketch Comedy Group. Though it doesn't really have all that much to do with today's topic, I'll try and remember to post it in the show notes for this show because, I mean, it's just awesome. Besides, there's nothing wrong with a little humor, right? Now, most of you already know what in the heck I'm referring to when I use the term B-roll. It's basically a film and TV term that it describes that type of footage that's, you know, supplemental or alternative footage that will ultimately, it'll be intercut with it with maybe a main shot. Oftentimes for doc filmmakers, this, this would be an interview. This main footage that I'm referring to, it was once referred to as A-roll, but I actually haven't heard it referred to that for a number of years now. Not that I've been around for <clears throat> many years, because of course I have not. Oftentimes on, on bigger crews, you know, the B-roll might be shot by second unit crews as you know, main scenes would be covered by the first unit. Of course, in our case, as, as documentary filmmakers, well, maybe not all of us, but you know, like 95% of us, we're not working with second units. We'll be shooting all the B-roll ourselves. And many times we're shooting that B-roll on the same day that we might be shooting, say, you know, in this instance, uh, an, an interview. In this case, it can sometimes feel a bit more like getting coverage, which is, you know, that's actually a word that I, I don't always have the best association with. It's used often, but I just don't have the best association with it. It was, um, in fact, it was what we called it when I was shooting for broadcast news, which is probably the reason I don't have the best association with it. You know, after after shooting the interview, the, the news reporter slash producer would say something like, okay, take five minutes and get some coverage and, and we'll head back, i.e. get some, you know, quick god-awful video of the tree that, you know, old Mrs. Jones called the fire department for to have her cat rescued from, right? Maybe get the the wide shot, you know, with a street, street sign in the house and, and the tree all in the frame. That's what I unfortunately associate the term coverage with. But, you know, it's not like this is an outdated term or anything. In fact, all the time on commercial jobs, you know, after we'd completed that main shot, you'd hear an AD, the assistant director, you know, call out moving in for coverage, which just usually meant that we were moving camera set up, you know, closer in to get tighter shots, which were um, often basically B-roll shots. Now, there is some bad B-roll out there, like some really, really bad B-roll out there. You've seen it. Trust me. I know you have. And in fact, that's a lot of what that awesome We Got B-Roll viral video is all about. You know, the unoriginal and, and sometimes just hilarious usage of bad or lazy looking video. We've all seen it. Like I said, this bad B-Roll that I'm talking about. Look, it's not always avoidable. I, I do get that. Sometimes you're on a really tight deadline, i.e., you know, television news. But most of the time, we as documentary filmmakers can take the time and get some quality shots. Um, we may not have all the resources in the world being doc filmmakers, but we do have creative minds. You know, we have the willingness. Um, we have we have the advantage of some pretty spectacular technology nowadays, right, at a relatively speaking low cost. So in my humble opinion, we shouldn't be shooting any more bad B-roll. So let's not, shall we? I've got some ideas that can help. The very first thing that I'm going to throw out there for you um, is a piece of equipment and a really valuable one. It's 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 pretty easy. Get yourself a damn tripod. Again, that may seem obvious to some of you, but if I have to see another piece of someone's passion project, you know, that's shot almost all handheld, i.e. shaky footage, I'm going to lose my mind. It's it, it's just not necessary anymore. You know, it, it's really not. If your film is cinema verite, fine, use handheld. It makes sense. I get that. Much of my first doc, Journey to Kathmandu, it was shot like this. You know, it was the aesthetic. It was it was appropriate for the environment that I was shooting in, and it was appropriate for for the type of story that I that I was telling. But cinema verite should never be an excuse for being a lazy shooter. Other than really faulty sound, there are a few things in film that will turn a viewer off. I promise you that. You know, then shaky footage that has no real, um, I guess, cinematic purpose, right? Um, other than to be shaky, maybe. <laughs> and let's face it, guys. You know, there are, there are some hands out there that are steadier than others. Um, and if later on your editor is trying to steady some of that shaky footage, just know that while it is possible, it's also a, can be a pretty taxing process. So yeah, it sounds pretty obvious, but make a tripod an essential part of your shooting kit. And, and maybe more than that, you know, please consider spending the extra cash and getting a set of sticks and a robust head, you know, that'll allow you to not only put some weight on your setup, you know, which will help eliminate some unwanted camera movement, 
but it will also allow for smooth pans and tilts. And that's a pretty big deal. Try and get yourself a head that has, in fact, you know, separate pan and tilt tensions. These will allow you to adjust the speed and tension of your movements. It'll also allow for smoother um, stop and starts. A cheaper tripod head will make your entries and exits of these pans and tilts look, you know, sudden. Or worse yet, it'll give you that sort of stop and start look. And trust me, it's a bitch trying to, to edit out of a finished camera move when, when you only have a couple of frames to work with. And you know I'm always looking out for my editing brethren. Now, I, I, I know and appreciate that a decent tripod can break the bank. And bank is not something that we often have as doc filmmakers. Um, splurging on a serious tripod setup, it can some it can even be the price of a brand new car. Some some Sackler heads alone go for like fifteen grand. I've seen some for twenty. Um, you know, but there are some tripod setups that you can get into for you know five hundred fifty or seven hundred dollars that'll work great for your shoots. You know, unless you have like thirty plus pound camera setups, um, then then you'd have to consider hooking up maybe with a with a rental place. Know, for your camera support needs, I'm currently using a um, uh, uh, it's a Manfrotto 504 HD video head. It's not amazing, but it works well. Um, I think it ran me 450 a year ago, and again, that's just for the head itself. A pair of sticks probably cost me another 250. It's not the best setup, but it does do a decent job. Um, and it actually does a much better job than this than the sticks and head that I bought for 450 total about five years ago. It actually does a much better job. You know, getting smooth stops and starts with that head drove me nuts. So it's worth the extra couple of hundred dollars in the case of your tripod setup. Um, the last thing I'll mention when it comes to tripods is that you should be using them often. Um, and what I mean, what I mean by that is, again, don't don't get lazy. And, and if you're unsure of whether or not to use the sticks when you're getting a shot, do it. You won't be sorry. It, it's going to look nicer. Um, it gives you another option. And, and believe me, it's going to make life easier for you or your editor later on. Oh, and I'll just throw this out there as well while we're on the top of, of, of extra footage. This isn't considered B-roll, of course, but if you have a second camera angle when you're shooting an interview, or anything else for that matter, it's generally a pretty bad idea to have camera A on sticks and camera B handheld. It, it, it may seem obvious, but I'm, I, I feel like I have to throw it out there because I've seen it done. Hell, I, I've even had a DP do it to me, and I made the mistake of not saying something during the shooting, and that's my fault. That's on me. Um, it just looks terrible, and, 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 and worse, it can look pretty amateurish. And again, your editor will be pretty damn unhappy with you, and you just don't want that, right? No, you don't. I'd now like to give mention to the importance of getting exposition shots when you're shooting B-roll. Um, exposition shots, they don't have to be exterior shots. They're really the shots that tell the who, the what, the where, and the when. Um, certainly they can be and often are exteriors of, of buildings, but they can also be you know, scenic nature close-ups. They can be historical photographs that, that might help tell your story. They could be, you know, shots of crowds of people at an event. They could be any number of things, really. That, but, but, but they basically keep you from having to spell it out for your audience. And I mean spell it out literally, as in writing it on screen cards or having it explained by your subject. It's never fun when you're cutting a scene and realizing you don't have the B-roll shots that'll best tell your story. And, and therefore, you end up resorting to maybe staying on that talking head to explain your subject or having to, you know, uh, basically inputs, make up some t title cards and put those in your timeline to spell your things out. It happens, of course. And sometimes, you know, we come up with those really cool creative solutions that make the film even better when we're faced with sort of this adversity, in this case, not having the B-roll that, that you wished you'd had. But if you can make sure to get some sufficient exposition shots, your film will certainly be better for it. Um, an easy tip that, that'll help you when shooting an interview is beforehand, you know, slap on a wide angle lens um, outside your building, get some pans and tilts of the exterior of the building, you know, again, or, or place where you'll be conducting your interview. Yes, it might be cheesy, but this is a last minute sort of safe move that you can always do before you actually conduct your interview. And that way you you know you at least have it, right? You have something. Again, it's quick and easy. Uh, hopefully you won't have to use it. But if you do need it, you do have something, right? 
The documentary filmmaker's B-roll is often shots that, that, that coincide nicely with what an interview subject um, may be talking about. And while they might be beautiful and striking and shot amazingly well, these types of shots can often really be the most obvious types of B-roll. They're the most obvious shots, right? But what if we shot and used B-roll that, was, that acted as a counterpoint to what the subject is saying? Or maybe it tells an additional story to what the subject's talking about. Using B-roll in this fashion, it can often be a refreshing um, and sometimes incredibly moving and powerful way to tell a story. Errol Morris did this incredibly effectively with The Thin Blue Line. Um, I've mentioned uh, doc filmmaker Les Blank on the show a number of times. He did the film Burden of Dreams, um, which was essentially um, the, the the documentary film covering the making of Werner Herzog's Fitzcarraldo. Using B-roll, to, he, he did it really well in that film. Uh, using B-roll to either tell another story or as a counterpoint to what is being talked about in a sequence, it's something you should consider doing. Um, if nothing else, it gives a more complex element, a more complex way of telling your story. Whether you're shooting and editing B-roll as a way to best describe the story that an interview subject is talking about, or you're using it as a counterpoint, one of the best things that you can do before your shoot is to spend some time researching the type of shots that are best going to achieve um, moving scenes, really. One of the more difficult tasks to pull off um, is to simply shoot an interview and, and then based on that content from the interview, go and shoot your B-roll of that environment, you know, right afterwards. If at all possible, research your interview subject beforehand, find out what they're all about, figure out who, you know, figure out how you might be using the, the content that you're hoping that they'll talk about, and then make a shot list prior to the day of shooting. Don't wait to hear how the interview goes. Of course, things will come up in the interview that'll spark some, some other shot ideas, of, of course. But if you can spend some time well beforehand coming up with your own ideas, constructing that shot list, you'll end up with much more compelling footage. I promise. And you won't end up with TV news looking coverage. Now, where do stylized shots like aerials, i.e. drone shots, and dolly and crane moves fit in all this? Obviously, when used smartly and shot well, they can be very moving pieces of B-roll for, for a particular scene. But simply because you have a drone doesn't mean you can just you know put it up in the air, roll on it, and just plop it into your sequences. First off, you need to have some kind of idea of the types of aerials that you'll want to shoot. You, know, you should be planning these out just like you'd plan out any of the other B-roll. Secondly, how you use them in your sequence is also very important. If you're just using them in your, you know, in your edit willy-nilly because you think it looks really cool, well, well, yeah, I think by now you know how I feel about all those drone shots used in films because they look really cool. That being said, um, I don't hate the drone shots. I really don't. Aerials can really elevate the look and feel of your film. I'm sure I mentioned this in my episode on making your documentary film stand out. I've got some great aerials that were shot by my great friend, uh, colleague, and, and fellow doc lifer, Patrick Farusian, that are really going to make our doc Elvis of Cambodia sing. They're going to work, you know, very nicely as exposition. Long, wide aerials of roaming rice fields and palm trees, rural countryside shots of men flinging their fishing nets into rivers. You know, really, really great stuff, right? If you check out our current teaser for the film, you'll be able to get some idea of what I speak of. I just wanted to say something positive. I really felt like I needed to say something positive about drone shots here because I think that I, I sometimes have a tendency to be pretty down on them. And, and I'll just say something quickly about dolly and crane shots. If you're strategic about how you use these, i.e., you know, you're using for a very specific aesthetic and reason, the use of dolly and crane shots can also make some for some really great B-roll. That being said, while technology, you know, as I mentioned earlier, has allowed us to, to be able to afford equipment like a pocket dolly, aka camera slider, or the the something like the Light Pro Gear Feather Crane, both of which we used actually in, in, in uh, Cambodia, if not used correctly, they'll actually make your footage look pretty amateur. I can't tell you how many videos out there I've seen where someone used a pocket dolly, again, AKA camera slider, and it's painfully obvious that they were using a pocket dolly as opposed to a true dolly, like, you know, like a Fisher dolly or something you'd find on, on a, a, a more commercial set. And, and so you can actually see some camera shake during their moves. 
um, which really defeat defeat in my mind. It, it it just defeats the purpose of the whole thing, right? Don't make the mistake of thinking that you can get this great ten to fifteen second move with a camera slider without seeing some unwanted camera movement. That's unrealistic. These things are not built for that. Now I realize there are you know there are now some automated systems out there where you can be hands off. So that's going to help, of course. Um, that's going to alleviate this. But all that all that I'm saying is here is, is be aware. You know, no, actually be critical. Let's do that. Let's be critical of our camera movements. You know, uh, make sure it's tops. Otherwise, you'll see some inconsistencies when you go to edit. And if you end up using a compromised shot in your sequence, well, that's on you. Um, maybe it's okay, maybe it's not. Um, remember this, you can always go to your monitor and watch playback, and you should, I encourage that. In fact, if you can get a sizable monitor, depending depending what your budget, it, or budget is, or depending on the environment you're shooting, shooting in, um, I highly encourage this, right? That allows you to replay your footage, um, and you can see on a bigger screen everything that's in there. And so you can see some of these finer sort of bumps and movements that you might not see on, on a smaller, say, camera monitor. Um, and it's going to save you save you a lot of pain later on in post. Um, if you can go to playback and then see that, you know what, we've got to go again. Look, your B-roll, it's going to be one of the most important elements to your film. You should never underestimate the power of it. Um, you should never, you know, underestimate the power of B-roll to not only tell an effective story, but to elevate it in a way that you want to tell that story. Your B-roll footage and then how it's edited can truly be something that sets your film apart from the rest of the pack. So please help me. Help us all. Avoid the TV news looking B-roll that so often is out there. And let's eliminate those bumpy shots on our slider moves. And please, don't fill your sequences with B-roll of really awesome looking drone shots. And now it's time for the Doc Lifer Community Question of the Week. The Doc Lifer Community Question of the Week is brought to you by DesktopDocumentaries.com, proud creators of one of the most accessible and applicable online education centers out there for documentary filmmakers. This week's email comes from an Aaron. From the sounds of it, Aaron's recently discovered the podcast, and, and she also happens to be days away from traveling to Southeast Asia, Laos to be more specific, to, to begin her first documentary film. This is what she had to say. Hi, Chris. I stumbled upon your podcast through one of your first episodes about score. I'm a total score nerd and agree the importance of score can't be overstated. I also really love episode number 36, where you talk about workflow tips for your first documentary. I'm actually producing and directing my first documentary, and it's what drew me to email you. It's called This Little Land of Minds, and she gives the URL which is of her website, which is um, www.thislittlelandofminds.com. And it's full-length feature about the resilience of the Lao people as they work to clear 80 million UXO from the U.S. secret war in Laos. I was shocked and so happy when you briefly mentioned this issue in an episode when you were talking about UXO in Cambodia. And for my listeners, UXO is unexploded ordnance. It's short for unexploded ordnance. Half of making this documentary is convincing and, edu and educating people about the fact that the U.S. bombed Laos more than any country in the world. So the fact that you were already aware of this issue made me so happy. This documentary is my directorial debut, so it's kind of like my journey to Kathmandu. Here's my YouTube channel where I'm vlogging my experience. And then she um, she actually gives a, a, a YouTube um, URL. If I remember, I'll get those up on the, on the, on the show notes for you to take a look at. Um, it's a pretty interesting vlog uh, that she has recently begun. That's I think it's I assume it's going to detail sort of her experiences um, as a first time documentary filmmaker and in particular in a country like Laos. Part of the reason I'm doing the vlog is because I found it so difficult in the beginning to find candid, honest, and humble advice on producing documentaries. I don't know about you, but I found the documentary filmmaking subculture to be kind of difficult to navigate. There's a lot of pretentiousness. So your humor, humility, and candid advice in your podcast is much appreciated. Hey, thank you very much. Okay, so I actually do have a question, and forgive me, I haven't listened to every episode yet, so you might have addressed this already. Like you, I've tried to develop a positive relationship with fundraising, but it is still the bane of my existence. I've probably applied for 15 grants and have only gotten one. It was an international reporting fellowship from Pulitzer, and Pulitzer was the only one I applied to where I got to meet with the decision makers in person, which I think is the reason I got it. I am very passionate about my topic, and I think that I am very friendly and well-researched. 
but this is hard to translate on a 12 page style grant application, especially when you're a first time filmmaker and they're already hesitant. So I am thinking about approaching individuals, people I can talk to and convince them in person. However, I know my strengths and for some reason closing a sale is not one of them. Do you have any advice on how to close a sale for an individual donation to your documentary? I'm headed back to Laos in a few days for the first round of production, and I think the teaser I cut from the stories we capture will help, but I still feel uncomfortable asking an individual for a large donation. Sorry for the lengthy email, just had a lot to say. Once again, thanks for the great podcast. I look forward to catching up in your future episodes. Well, Aaron, thank you for your email. It makes me very happy to hear that you found us here on The Documentary Life, and even happier to hear that you've set out to begin your first foray into the world of documentary filmmaking. There's so much that I could comment here on this email, but in the interest of time, I'll just do my best to address your question. I can I can share some of the other thoughts in a, in a future email to you. It sounds like you're on the right track with finding some funding for your film. And by the way, congrats on the Pulitzer Grant. I know it probably feels like an, an amount, immense amount of work applying for these 15 grants and, and maybe only getting one of them. But you know what? You've already been awarded one more grant than probably many of, many of the listeners out there. Um, you should be thankful for this. Not that you aren't, of course. I'm sure that you are. But you can now use this experience to leverage other grants. And, and I realize I don't think you want to necessarily discuss grants here. When you're talking about closing the deal, I, I think you're talking about on an individual donor level, right? Donor level, I should say. Which, by the way, I think is a it's an excellent idea. It sounds like you have a pretty good sense when someone meets you in person and gets to have a feel for, for you know for who you are and what your film's about. Uh, that it works well for you. And, and I believe this to be the case for a lot of us. Certainly it is for me. Um, I know when I'm able to be in the presence of someone that I'm asking money from, as opposed to cold calling or, or, or emailing someone, I tend to have way more success in this way. I think it's because they have an opportunity to see what the film project truly means to me. Um, people like to see people be passionate about things. And it's no different with film or when we're out there trying to raise money for our, for our films. So I, I think you're most definitely on the right track approaching people individually. Maury Warshawski, who is here on, on episode number 15, he talks about this quite a bit in his book, Shaking the Money Tree. If I'm remembering this correctly, Maury, he believes that approaching potential donors sort of one-on-one, -on -one, it directly often makes up like 85% of how doc filmmakers raise their monies. I think that there's a misconception out there that that uh, if you're not raising funds via grants, then then you're not bringing in very much money. And then, in fact, people who have money for documentary films have raised that mostly from grants. According to Maury's, Maury's studies, that is not the truth. Um, and I believe it from, from, from talking with other doc filmmakers and certainly um, engaging with people more and more on this show. Um, there's another episode you might check out. Um, I believe it was an early one, uh, maybe number five. It's still one of the episodes that, that I often refer to because the content, it's so rich. Uh, it was a conversation that I had with with fellow doc filmmaker Lydia B. Smith. She was a, uh, a doc filmmaker behind uh, a film called Walking the Camino. Um, it's a film in, in which she basically raised, I think, over a couple hundred thousand dollars, you know, with this amazing grassroots and crowdfunding campaign. Um, one of the things she talked a lot about was this idea of getting right, right? Filmmakers getting right with money. That that a lot of you guys, a lot of doc filmmakers that that she knew, including herself had some real issues with money, specifically asking others to part with their money. But she decided to meet these fears head on. She mentions a book by the name of The Soul of Money as being a big influence on her. Um, I, I, I can't remember the name of the author right now, but I'm sure you can find it pretty quickly. And certainly in the episode, the author's name is mentioned. Um, I believe she may have, uh, and, and she meaning Lydia, may have even workshopped with this woman, um, with the author. Anyhow, if you haven't already, you should definitely check out episode number five. Hey, maybe download it before you get on your plane for Laos, right? It's a long flight, lady. Why not use it to get inspired, right, for making your film? Uh, I've received some other emails recently from people, actually, who'd like to hear some more podcasts about grants and crowdfunding and raising monies for your doc film. So please look for some of that in the near future. Uh, I think it's a great idea to get talking about this stuff again. It's, it's needed. So so thank you for that email, Aaron, and, and thank you for sharing your story. I look forward to bringing some more um, some more quality content on this show to you, and, and I definitely look forward to hearing about you know how your shoot goes for you when you get back from Laos. So please, you know, send me a follow-up at that time when you get back. I'd love to hear from you. 
If you have a comment, question, or suggestion for the show, you can always email me at chris at barongfilms.com. It's chris, which is C-H-R-A-S at barongfilms, B-A-R-A-N-G films.com. And uh, you too could be highlighted here on, on an upcoming Doc Life or Community Question of the Week. When we come back from the break, we'll be talking with documentary filmmakers, post-production business owners, proud parents of twin three-year-old girls, and overall power couple Jonathan Lecoque and Claire Lehman, who live and work and run their company, Coat of Arms, based out of the tiny hamlet known as Helvetia, West Virginia. Don't want to miss it. We'll be right back. When I first started making documentary films, I was often making them entirely on my own dime. It wasn't that it was a conscious decision on my part, I just really wanted to get out and start making my film. Does this sound familiar to you? When you have a great idea for a doc and the opportunity to get out there and start shooting, you don't want to let something like money get in the way of that. And for a while, it may not, but unfortunately, unless you have unlimited resources, eventually it will. Not having money for your doc film will slow you down, reduce your crew size, your film production values and aesthetics, even the story you're able to tell. And that's not even accounting for the additional stress, frustration, and your inability to work on the project full time. We don't accept that for ourselves anymore, and we don't want you to accept it either. Money is out there for every documentary film, and that includes yours. Every day, money is donated or awarded to documentary films. Why not yours? The trick is in knowing where to look for it and how to secure it for your film. In the Documentary Academy, we have the most comprehensive funding module that you will find anywhere in any course on fundraising for your documentary film. We cover the A to Z on raising funds for your film so you will never again be left wondering where the money's coming from. Enroll in the Academy today by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash academy and start your journey to raising $10,000, $25,000, or even $100,000 for your documentary film. Jonathan Lecoque and Clara Lehman, welcome to The Documentary Life. I'm excited to have you guys on today's program. Um, I've known the both of you for a little while now, and in fact, I have done work with you. And uh, I've wanted to speak with you guys for quite a bit of time here, and I'm excited that we get to do that now. Us too, man. We're pumped to be here. Our pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, I initially know you um, when you and and your colleague, John Severson, had reached out to me years ago. At this point, I don't even remember the year. Was it 2006, 2008? And, it, and you guys had reached uh, out. I think, to, oh, yeah, 2007 maybe. I, yeah, somewhere in there. I think you're right. Six might be right. Yeah. And you guys had reached out to me to do some editing work on, on a Cambodian documentary. At the time, it had the working title Year Zero. Um, that became a perfect soldier, and we'll discuss that, you know, in a, in a little bit. But, but you and your business partner John were living in in in, uh, in Chicago, which is where you guys are, are from. At the time when you approached me to work on your zero, at that time, why don't you let us know what was going on in your life and how documentary became to be a part of it, and then in particular this project in Cambodia. Sure. Uh, well, it's a ways back. Uh, <laughs> I guess it starts um, soon after college. Mm. I graduated 2004 from Carleton College with my wife Clara, who I'm in business with now. Yes, um, and came came back to Chicago, uh, hungry, you know, to to do something in film, and that wasn't necessarily it didn't have to be documentary initially. So I was also kind of dabbling in production assistant work on features and uh, television and that sort of thing. But um, very soon after returning. Um, I, you know, John Severson, a, a best friend of mine, um, right. we had always, uh, you know, we, we had always made films, uh, funny shorts, never serious at all. I mean, things that <laughs> would, would make our souls melt if people saw, I was going to say, know, I don't just, think I ever saw any of those. I don't think I ever was ever successfully <laughs> able to get John to show me any of those clips. <laughs> that he's, he did, he did well then. He's a I good man. <laughs> he, he's a good man indeed. Um, but anyway, so like we did, you know, we had like a high school film group. We, um, we just, we loved it, you know? And, uh, I will say, I guess I'm stepping back a little bit more here. Like even through college for the first half, at least I didn't think that I was going to do anything in film. Um, I started studying for, uh, becoming a psychologist or a therapist Ah. and, um, about halfway through, um, 
just sort of realized that I sort of hated the idea of listening to you know people and making it seem like I had the answers I guess because <laughs> I don't have the answers and that is not a knock on therapists at all but right. just my own you know, my own issues I suppose <laughs> and uh, around that time I started to kind of think about film again because it was a passion a love something that I I had fun doing and I there was a like a film studies group there and I started thinking like oh man people are actually studying this and that that point Clara mm. who I was dating she actually bought me, I think with my parents, uh, like she got them to come together with her and they bought me a camera. And so uh, then I started doing little shorts and things of that nature uh, at Carlton um, for, I guess, the second half. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, you nearly had a, like a, a minor in film, but not technically. Right. Yeah. So at Carl it was liberal arts. So I, I ended up getting a BA in psychology. Yeah. I almost got... I don't know if it's double major. Yeah, I almost double majored in religion and then did a concentration in media studies. But anyway, so I, you know, fast forwarding because it, it's boring stuff, you know, like came out of college, re reconnected with John since yeah. we were both in the same place. And we started a company called Smiling Toad Productions, right. which still exists. John okay. still runs Smiling Toad, yeah. which is wedding videography, wedding production. And the whole impetus for that was how can we make movies because we have no money and that was filming weddings. And so the initial goal was to take the finances that we would get from doing as many weddings as possible and funnel that into feature doc work. And that is where Year Zero, which is now A Perfect Soldier, came from. Right. Yes. And John had traveled the world prior to that. And that's how he he was the one that had the interest in Cambodia. That's correct? right. Yeah. So John, lucky dog, mm -hmm. right out of college, traveled. No, I wouldn't say around the world. True. I mean, I guess I it is. He I did. He, he did actually did. travel around yeah. the world. Did he? OK, I uh, think I remember that now. Yeah. And one of his stops was Cambodia. He spent some time in Phnom Penh and in Siem Reap and had heard of, you know, Akira, who ended up being the the hero of our story of a perfect soldier and uh, went and visited his uh, sort of very makeshift uh, low budget let's say landmine museum and right. it was just sort of taken by this character so him traveling the world was the start of that specific story and then us coming together was the start of trying to you know make a living doing what we love right right and 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 to kind of shed a little light for our listeners. Um, it would be, of course, after pr uh, principal photography, after production of the film that you guys would bring me on for editing. And, it, and, and for me, it was an interesting it was an interesting time for me because it was within a, within a couple of years of editing a film, Bomb Hunters, which I've talked about a number of times um, on, on, on this show, which was sort of my entrance into both documentary as well as Southeast Asia, in particular Cambodia, which has since kind of become a home away from home for me. And the interesting part of, of, about about meeting up with you guys, or, or I guess meeting you guys, uh, was the fact that you, here you guys are doing a film um, about a subject, uh, this person, uh, Akira, who you're referring to, and 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 I had sat down with Akira at his sort of makeshift, as you as you described, uh, uh, landmine museum, and and we had spent a couple of days filming with him, and in fact, our film was going to have a, he was going to be a large part of our initial initial film that uh, that the director had received a Fulbright scholarship for. And all intents and purposes, this film was going to be very much about him. The film didn't end up being about him at all, as often happens with documentary films. And it, it was mm -hmm. wild that you guys would end up approaching me to help edit on your film. And here we go. Here's a story with, with Akira. Hope never dies should never give up on hope. And I define hope as the assurance that life will always triumph over death.
what was it like for you, Jonathan, uh, as, as you know, in th- at this point, a first time documentary filmmaker, or at least first time sort of feature documentary filmmaker? What was that like for you to be doing it in the environment of Cambodia, developing world? Uh, well, I think that <laughs> because I didn't get, I wouldn't, <laughs> I would say I didn't get a true like filmmaking education. Yeah. I went into it super raw, like yeah. I was naive and innocent and so i loved it you know what i mean but um as as you probably recall both john and i kind of went into things you know with with fun and uh, and and uh i i guess high spirits but with without yeah. a ton of education and experience sure. ourselves so um i think because of that it kind of worked out in some ways like we were i don't know we were very open i was to gonna say find- in what ways did what ways do you feel that benefited you yeah, well, I mean, I think in in some ways, a lot of times, like even now, like we know so much that it stop we stop ourselves Isn't from doing things because we that's know something. what it takes. Whereas here, I mean, we were just you know like children, kids that were like, oh yeah. man, wouldn't it be cool if we filmed about this guy in Cambodia and we went there? <laughs> and I mean, John, John was there for three months. I mean, he was there a whole month before me and Jose Rios, who right. uh, was the cinematographer of the film, right. went. And then we were there, Claire, how we like- We were uh, there a full month. A full month, mm-hmm. yeah. So maybe he was even there two months. I mean, yeah. it was a long time. Maybe it was one month and one month. I think he like bookended it. Yeah, and he stayed a little mm-hmm. bit longer, that's true. But anyway, so I mean, it was like, you know, very, I don't want to say seat, off, seat of the pants kind of a thing, because we right. did spent a lot of time outlining and we, yeah. yeah we talked to rich we talked to brooks who was also who ep the film we reached out obviously to akira and, and hort prior yes. we talked to the, the dc cam we talked to documentation center you know like yeah. we were very much and very much due to john who had been there already yeah so it wasn't like, i don't want to give the impression that we didn't you know dot some i's and cross some t's but outside of some of the logistical aspects, yeah. we were very much... I think you guys were very eager and there was no fear because you're around, you were literally around landmines and all of you were, you know, mid-20s and... We were idiots. And not really <laughs> just walked around with Akira with flip-flops and right. a stick and, yes, and it's captured very, it. It's very true. I mean, I think it's, it's fun to talk about with Clara here because like, <laughs> obviously you have... The, very different meanwhile i'm at home making bacon that's paying for the trips no <laughs> you're right I had to up and uh took care of renting the rent and the uh utility yeah. bills and, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I do recall that you guys it was exciting i don't remember i don't remember you being very fearful Mm-mm. there were only two days that you said it was a little bit scary mm. yeah mm. i think mm. we were so i mean chris you know man it's like we were yeah. so young yeah, yeah. we didn't know better and it kind of worked in our favor in many different ways. That's right. It could have totally legitimately blown up in our face in some ways, you know, which is scary to think about now. But, um, yeah, it was an exciting time. I mean, I remember, Clara, you saying you wish you could come. And it was, you know, we were all pretty jazzed about it. Yeah. There's, you know, there's a couple of things there and, and, and that we can unpack. And, and one of them is this idea of um, of using sort of naivete in sort of our, our filmmaking adventures to our advantage, I, you guys nailed it when you brought up this idea of, you know, the more sort of the older as we get, or, or not even the older that we get, but the more experience that we accrue, the more we seem to, you know, have this idea of what it takes to to make a commercial or make a, a short film or make a documentary. And sometimes that stops us. Sometimes we convince ourselves that we are unable to do something because we assume that, you know, we don't have the resource or resources that, that, that are needed for a certain shot or for a certain location. And, and the beauty of what you've described, Jonathan, and the beauty of what so many of us filmmakers experience early on in our filmmaking careers is that there aren't those filters they, they, they don't stop us we we just we're excited about what we're doing and the passion just kind of moves us to do to do the work and and really there's nothing that can get in the way of that that's that's sort of the beauty of that feeling and and i don't know guys i mean what do we do right what do we do 
now, as more experienced and seasoned filmmakers, what do we do to kind of recapture that? How can we take those blocks and filters away and sort of can we ever recapture some of that spirit, some of that even naivete, if you will, that at least drives us to push through um, when we tell ourselves, no, we, do, we don't have the, the budget for that or we don't have the, um, the manpower for that or whatever the case is. What can we be doing now? Well, I, I, I actually have some ideas that, yeah. I mean, I, I think on, on, for, first of all, like, I think like we have to kill our ego in some ways mm. and we need to like be okay failing. And mm. there's a psychological aspect to it that I think can be pretty heavy for some people. Uh, cause yeah. we do stop ourselves. We don't want to fail. We're afraid that we're not good enough. And there's a whole heaviness to that, that is important to, I think, think about as artists. Cause we are so like, what is the word? Like exposed. we're so exposed, yeah. you know, it's like, exposed this is our story. Yeah. Vulnerable. Exactly. But I will say one thing that Clara and I do m more now than before, because we have experience is we continually try new things. So Clara and I have found ways to, I mean, we are sort of exposing ourselves in this sense, but like right. try new things. So for example, like we, we, Clara wrote, I produced and edited in the end, even though you basically edited a whole other version of the film of a perfect soldier, right, right, right. You know, like we have some documentary experience. So like recently we've done a lot in animation, which has forced us, I think in mm. some ways to relive those experiences because like so we did death loves life which was an animated short it's yes. only four minutes it took us like what a year more a year i mean it was insane and part yeah, of it of was course. like we we knew from the commercial end how to do this but not from a more cinematic filmmaking end. and mm. and that was an educational experience for us and that was so i think just to distill it down it's to challenge yourself to try new things, you know, if it's new mediums, new styles, new types of storytelling. Yeah. And I think if you get stuck on one project, maybe trying a different one, like, and not, I don't mean like having too many pots on the stove at once because okay. that can be a little overwhelming. I, I mean like letting like one project kind of ride. And if it, if it's kind of reaching a lull and you need a break, let something else get in the way for a little bit. Right. Because I don't think that's always bad. Like sometimes I think people are too hung up on like, I didn't finish this yet. I didn't finish this. And it's like, damn it, leave me alone. I'm going to get it done. I want to focus on this other little thing and have su little successes here and there for this larger project that might eventually be a success, but it's just going to take me a little longer. Yeah. I think, you know, that one thing that makes me think of is, you know, we are artists, you know mm. what I mean? And I think that a big thing for artists is creativity and passion and inspiration. And so when Clara, you were saying what you were, what you were saying before, it kind of made me think of how as artists, we kind of need to follow what inspires us. Mm. And sometimes, it may you be know, totally unrelated to what you're doing. Exactly. Or like right. logistics get in the way or the technical stuff gets in the way or whatever it is. And you kind of, as an artist need to allow you know, your strokes, the paintbrush strokes to kind of leave this page for another in order to mm. refine yourself in some yeah, ways. Yeah, and I think that if we tap into that more, we're more successful and thus we get past that ego and all those confidence issues that, you know, always curtail or, you know, create problems for us. And I think that that is very positive. And if you look at that challenge as a, yeah. as a window into uh, a new way of thinking, I think it's more, it's more effective. I always tell people like, first off, if you finish a film, a short film, whatever, like you're already like, you're already succeeding. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. think of all the millions of like stories that want to be told that aren't. And at least you have something finished. Coat of Arms is your, I don't want to say post-production company. It's its often how I think of it, but you guys are producing things now, right? You have animation, you have short films, you're doing commercials. And so for, for my listeners, why don't you describe what Coat of Arms is, and then we'll get to how it came to be. Well, I think we're, we're definitely in an interesting place now with Coat of Arms. We, we started Coat of Arms as a post company. Yeah. Uh, officially like all we do is post yeah. and I think we quickly realized that internally we are more than that because Clara writes Clara produces Clara directs I edit but I also help direct and produce and so like between the two of us and the people that we bring into our projects yeah. 
I mean, we're, we're kind of uh, agency like, but we don't want to be an agency. It you does know what feel I mean? that the, way at times. Yeah, for sure. You know, and then uh, I don't I mean, I guess we, we still I'll be honest with you, like we and and if people have ideas, hit us up and let us know <laughs> because like we still, we still describe ourselves as a post company oh. and we, you know, we kind of say like a creative post company, you yes. know, like, but it's like, how do we describe ourselves? Yeah. Like boutique, this boutique, that, yeah. you know? And, um, I guess what, you know, you were saying and to sort of answer the question, like we create content that we love mm for ourselves and for our friends, but then we also create content for corporate and commercial clients. So that is, you know, the range is, is completely the gamut from writing and scripting to, you know, concepting and uh, development to shooting and editing if, if we need to do it all. Or just color correction on someone's film. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Absolutely. How does documentary how does it play a part in, 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 in some of your work with Coat of Arms? It's funny because we, we don't really talk too much about this, but I think both of us are drawn to documentary work. We're drawn to real life situations exactly. and people, like even in our own personal work, you know, like oftentimes, let's say we have five ideas, three or four of them are like doc oriented, you know? <laughs> so I think that's just sort of a natural inclination of ours. Um, but specifically to the work we do, it does tend to be client specific, you know, like some of the Jaguar Land Rover stuff is very doc oriented because it's almost PR and real yeah. life, you know, uh, focused, you know, like with new cars and events and that type of yeah. thing. And then the WebMD stuff is very doc oriented because they're trying to, you know, tell people what's going on and how to better yeah, your life. Express, or, um you know, these illnesses through a real, a l real life lens rather than seeing it just, Oh, like I checked my symptoms and I have these, right. these, this diagnosis. So they're trying to make it much more personable. And the only way to do that is through doc. Well, um, let's be honest. Like a lot of times the reenactment oriented stuff, is very it, awkward. It, it's, let's just say it's <laughs> difficult to do it really well. And some people do, you mm -hmm. know, but, um, and, and then I think the only it's, other it's why it's an exciting time for us documentary filmmakers because we're entering entering into this realm where documentary is becoming um, a very not only an accept accepted part of of what we're seeing sort of in the commercial world, but it's becoming it, it, the lines are definitely being blurred with this idea of of narrative and documentary, and that's so beneficial for for documentary filmmakers. And we talk a lot about that on the program. For sure, it's true. I mean, it's, it's as but if yeah. it's become an aesthetic, almost, you know, in some ways for a lot of commercial pieces that we see. Yeah. Well, I think that there's something that is attainable through doc, really strong doc work that you, I mean, it's just incredibly rare and difficult to attain through, you know, the written scripted. form. You know what yeah, I mean? It's, right. it's that real life quality that just tugs at your heart because it's like, this is like, this is real, you know? The, the short film that you guys produced last year is is the name of it is called Home. Tell us a bit how that came to be. I, I, of course, you shared it with me last year, Jonathan. It is a lovely film, and and I was very happy that you shared it with me. And how did that film come to be for you guys? Sure, uh, Emily Hilliard, which is a local folklorist, she's the West Virginia folklorist. Um, she was interested in doing a piece on our uh, local community and particularly about uh, this, the seasonal year in Helvetia. And so she was writing a piece and she wanted to pair it with a video. Um, and she had met us here locally as she was doing some of her interviews and research and, and loved our work. And then she um, was working on this for the uh, magazine, an online publication called The Bitter Southerner. Right. And so they had very modest uh, stipend that they could offer. And we were <laughs> totally board and um actually you know you could say that the webmd projects have helped pay for that one or You're whatever right, of course like whatever, yeah whatever um income that we had saved up we kind of poured it into that project because well, technically it was, we didn't even you know yeah so um but yeah that's kind of what how we got into it and then yeah. it became much bigger than we thought it was going to be it was originally going to be about a two-minute video <laughs> and we 
I think we shot for what three days? Four yeah. Days? Well, I, I think what happened was, so the Bitter Southerner, lovely online publication, had a very limited budget. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like five hundred bucks. Of course. And right, right, right. Uh, we decided, why don't we do what we want to do yeah. for free? Yep. And so we just did it as our own short, and then they, I think, uh, donated the money to one of a, lo a local organization. But it allowed us to be like, what do we really want this to be about? Fantastic. You know? it, it's about. And it's then a, we had a platform to share the video, which is right. amazing. It often doesn't happen with work that you do is you don't know what to do with it afterward. And yeah. now we have this platform already set up, and we can do whatever we want. So it's now going to be a, a 16 minute video, you know? Yes, right. Exactly. Well, and. And just to back up for a second, so we're in a, in a town called Helvetia in West Virginia. <laughs> yes. It is extremely remote. It's yep. in, in a valley, kind of in the middle of the state to some degree. And, you know, you have to drive 45 to an hour to get here from anywhere. You yep. know, like any any large town that would have like... We drive to get groceries always an hour. Yep. Right. Yep. The doctor's office is an hour. Yeah. But it's, it's a Swiss settled town that has, it's really rich in the Swiss culture and history. And a lot of, let's say, a lot of times, you know, news and, uh, you know, other publicists and uh, filmmakers even want to tell stories about Helvetia. And I think <laughs> we, I hope you recall, we were kind of like, like, let's tell the story our way. Because it's, it's off like, here come these people, these reporters, they come in and it's like, oh, this is what this town's about. And it's like, well, let's tell it. <laughs> our side you know yeah. and and so then we thought we got really excited about talking to three local folks yeah. that are big in the community that would that normally don't talk to the reporters that, that you know sort of a perspective that an insider perspective to yeah. some degree that is still artistic and yeah. you know and what's the true Helvetia I mean unfortunately what happens is you get the story that everyone kind of regurgitates the over and over. The one minute bite-sized story that everybody's exactly, exactly I'm telling sure the same that story. Happens with, that happens with anything, like Akira, yeah. I'm sure it happened in Cambodia and things like that. But right, right. And so it kind of, it's not satisfying, especially for those of us that are living in that community. And we see something much more special than just that bite-sized soundbite, you know? Some people have told me, this is more than one, uh, but they said, the first time I came to Helvish, I felt like I was coming home. That they had never been here before, but it just felt like some place they were called to. I just think that uh, you know, people find a calmness here they don't find somewhere else, a quietness. We've been talking here about, you know, documentary film. We've been talking about Coat of Arms, your business, and, and you've mentioned clients, and you've talked about all the work and all the creative work and, and, and all the pay work that you guys have done. And then you sort of, you know, offhandedly say, yeah, yeah, by the way, we're based in this tiny remote sort of mountain town called Helvetia, West Virginia. When else, but sort of this time and in this day and age, could that sort of thing even be possible? So I'm excited to kind of unwrap that a little bit. How did Helvetia first happen for you guys? Why and how did you guys end up there? Well, I grew up in Helvetia. I was born, you know, the 45 minutes away that we talked about, but I grew up here my entire life, went to school, kindergarten through 12th grade in a, a and graduated with a class of four. The school only houses about 35 students. Um, and then, so that's our connection to Helvetia and I love it here. It's, this is home. It's wow. good. I've been called home literally. And so while we were away for college in Northfield, Minnesota, and then in Chicago, which is where Jonathan grew up, um, we lived quite a long time there. And really, I would say that we got our experience and, uh, proved ourselves within Chicago because we were able to compete and and uh, gain confidence within a much larger market. Um, but I always, my heart hurt for the mountains and home. So Jonathan, <laughs> the, the sweetheart that he is, um, agreed that he would come back with me. And uh, we were already married at this point, but um, I just 
really needed to get back. And so we, we, we brazenly, uh, with our company only one year old, decided that we could make it work because they had gotten, luckily, DSL internet and... Um, <laughs> Yeah, internet and city water recently. So we were like, we're ready to go back. So um, that's how kind of we were like sure that we could do it because we uh, knew that the internet was available, that all we needed was that connection and we would be able to hire people all over the globe um, and hopefully maintain and continue to grow our contacts within um, the Chicago land area and elsewhere. That's yeah. I mean, before we came, came, yeah, I mean, before we came to Helvetia, it's worth noting that we had at least three years in Chicago on our own right. when I was working with John, Smiling mm -hmm. Toad, building some contacts. Then we moved to Fairmont, West Virginia, and I worked in Pittsburgh area right, for right. An and, and a film studio and gained contacts. Then we moved back to Chicago, gained right. more contacts, yeah. started Coat of Arms, right. and then came here. So like, there is a lot of time. Like, I don't think that we would have been able to just, maybe now, maybe but, Maybe we know. would have. It, it just depends. But yeah. um, I definitely think that that helped us. Like, For sure. Like, getting our feet wet in a bigger city was important. Um, but now, we honestly don't really, we would not, we can't, we don't even look back. Like, it doesn't feel, I guess, okay, we can't always upload a video very quickly. But um, <laughs> not like we're not, you know, able to get work done and, and succeed. But our clients would have you know that we get everything done on time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yes, That's all. We just stay up all night. No. <laughs> so you've moved to Helvetia, West Virginia. You you have this business that's a couple of years old and 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 you're working your butt off you know, to, to, to make this business work in a tiny rural town in West Virginia. And you're doing your own projects. And yet you also have, you have a set of three-year-old twins. How on earth are you guys making this work? Yeah, that was, that's a good one. I don't know either. It is a good one. And I need to know. <laughs> um, honestly, what we do is we take turns a lot and mm -hmm. then um, we have hired sitters whenever we can. And yeah. then um, the girls just started Montessori school. Mm -hmm. So we get a couple hours there together to work. And then we work a lot in the evenings and, and late into the night. Um, and obviously it's kind of like seven days a week that we're working, not just the five. Yeah. I think, yeah, of course. honestly, I, I think that we, I love, this is one thing I love about us at least, like not to be whatever, like, and I'm looking at Clara who I adore, you know, it's <laughs> like, <laughs> we like both Clara and I are hardworking, driven people who value our creative lives mm. in a big way. But we also both want to be parents, want to have a family, and don't want to prioritize that less in some ways to our work. We kind of carry these things and try to balance them. And so what has worked really well for us, and I don't know that it was ever planned this way, but it just sort of naturally came to be, it's like, I'm with the girls Monday, Tuesday, Clara's working full-time Monday, Tuesday, then I'm working Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, while Clara's with the girls, and then usually on the weekend, I'd say, like one day you, a weekend, we or you know, like we're kind of yeah, like doing we a half split day it up of work and take some time off, day. and all of us are together, and yeah, it, it you know what? Now that they are three, it's gotten significantly easier. Mm. Um, when they were really little, I I do have to say that that first year, I don't think I got to work as much. As much, no. I literally sure. almost had to take that year off um, between just taking care of them and and recovering myself, yeah. and so. That was pretty tough, and I I did get sad because like you miss that creative outlet, you miss, um, you know, and as a woman who yeah. is trying to balance career with family, you're kind of upset with yourself, but also really proud that you're you know, you know, you've got this these beautiful children and a business and and a house and you're you're comfortable, but you kind of um, always feel like you're trying to find that balance again. And, and now we finally hit our stride within the last two years. I have no idea how you guys do it. I mean, I have some idea, of course, you know, Steph and I have our, you know, our own business and, and we have a one and a three year old, but, uh, just hearing you guys, hearing you guys talk about everything that you're doing out in Helvetia right now is just, uh, it's an inspiration in and to itself. 
I'm excited to have my listeners, you know, really kind of listen to the, to the words and the wisdom that you guys have imparted today. And um, I can't thank you enough. Hey, well, thanks for having us. I, I will say, I don't know about the wisdom part. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're, still, we're, we're still, still figuring, figuring this out. You know what I mean? And I think I think that's sort of everybody to some degree. It's, we have bad days too. Oh, heck yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, we're, you know, Steph and I and the kids are, are back in the States now. And, um, you know, we are really a drive away at this point. And, um, and we do plan on checking out, uh, I think I mentioned to you, Jonathan, North Carolina here in the near future. And so um, yeah. we'd love to love to hook up with you guys at some point. Yeah, Definitely, that'd be, man. Le- that'd be great. We'd that love to be, see you. It would be awesome, man. And don't cut yourself short, man. You got two kids, a business, a podcast. You, you've, it's, I mean, let's be real, man. I think you're doing just, <laughs> doing just, just fine. fine. I appreciate it, you guys. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I, I know, I know that you're uh, you're leaving tomorrow first thing for Chicago, Jonathan. So. Um, Clara, it was lovely speaking with you. Jonathan, thank you so much as well. And um, we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks, Chris. Sounds good, man. Don't forget, we'd love to have you join us in the Documentary Academy. Come and take a look at how we can help you make your best documentary film at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. That's thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.